This was happening in a region where religious cults were the norm. So Rasputin, he'd always believed himself to be a mystic, blessed with the power from above. It was some kind of holy man or healer. Most people have heard of Rasputin at one time or another. But opinions about him vary from religious mystic to sex crazed cultist to evil charlatan. Indeed, he was a truly dark character with a horrific influence on the Russian people and the royal Romanov family. In the early 20th century, Rasputin convinced the Romanovs that he was a holy man with great healing powers and sight of the future. He climbed his way up the royal ranks and into the Russian government, eventually leading the downfall of the very family that trusted him with their lives. I'll let you decide what kind of man Rasputin was. Let's dive in. Rasputin's story begins on January 21st, 1869 in Siberia. It's one of the most unforgiving places to live. Cold is an understatement and is filled with prisons where Russia's unwanted men are sent to do hard labor and die of frostbite or starvation. It was also an area full of religious cults, secret sects, and self-proclaimed holy men, such as the village where Rasputin was born, Pokrovska. It was a miracle that Rasputin had survived, his family thought. His mother had seven stillbirths before him. Unfortunately, he would go on to believe that he was a miracle, even a reincarnation of Christ. But again, this was happening in a region where religious cults were the norm. Not only is it the very fringes of civilization where pagan shadows hang over everybody's lives, irrespective of the presence of official Christianity, it's also crushingly dull. Rasputin was indeed a troubled child, even for Siberian villagers. He claimed that he had frequent divine visions and apparently he could heal horses just by touching them. But there was nothing divine about him. As a child and teenager, Rasputin would steal and drink until he couldn't walk straight anymore. Opinions about Rasputin were already split. Some said he was the second coming of Christ and some said he had the devil inside him. By the age of 28, Rasputin had married a woman from a neighboring village and had four children with her, but he hadn't changed at all. He still drank all day and stole to get by. One day, he stole a horse and word spread pretty fast. This was a particularly bad theft, so Rasputin mounted his horse and galloped out of the village for good, abandoning his family and his life as he knew it. He entered a monastery looking for shelter, but he ended up staying there for a few months. Being part of a religious group spoke to him. He'd always believed himself to be a mystic, blessed with the power from above. Now, he could be around people like himself. A monk named Makarish was Rasputin's mentor. He was a famous holy man, and he'd been an advisor to Empress Alexandra. Inspired, Rasputin joined his order and became a monk as well. They then proceeded to wander from village to village, spreading their belief. This became a lifestyle and a passion for Rasputin. He was never returning to his old life. He would take very long pilgrimages through the harsh nature, wearing shackles to make his experience even harder, and he wouldn't wash for months. During his pilgrimages, Rasputin intersected with the Hustis. This was a cult stemming from Orthodox Christianity, but with a strange twist. They held secret meetings where they would attempt to purge their sins. They would do so by asphyxiating one another and letting go at the very last moment. They would dance and spin until they would pass out. Then they would engage in orgies. The Hustis were outlaws. This is, I think, a very significant point, that they were, like all the sects, uh, the offshoots of the Russian Orthodox Church, they were an underground movement. They were on the run. Everything the Hustis did was to get into a trance. They called their spin dancing spiritual beer. Needless to say, after a few months with this sect, Rasputin felt like a changed man. He wandered all around Russia. Then he made his way south, all the way to Mount Athos in Greece. When he returned to his home village, everyone can see that he was different. He had a frightening, intense stare, and he had an agenda. He continued to meet with his hosties friends, using his home basement as a place for their frenzied orgies. His wife had no say in this, but Rasputin wouldn't be in Siberia for much longer. He had bigger plans. During his time in Siberia, Rasputin had already become so famous that people all over the country would come visit him, hoping for his miraculous healing powers. So Rasputin decided to take his fame one step further. He appears to have seen a vision of the Virgin Mary, and she apparently told him to go to St. Petersburg, um, where he would help 
the Imperial family. Remember, he was friends with Makarish, the priest that had been an advisor to the Romanovs. Of course, Makarish had all the connections. Through him, Rasputin met Sergei Trofanov, aka Iliador, a high-level priest with exceptional influence in St. Petersburg. But Iliador and his priest were shocked by Rasputin's appearance, his stare, and, well, his smell. But just like he did with everyone else, Rasputin charmed the priests with his healing abilities and natural wisdom. Iliador named him the Saint. In the early 20th century, St. Petersburg's aristocracy was fascinated by mysticism. So at age 34, Rasputin was visiting Russia's top aristocratic salons and impressing men and women alike with his charm and strange abilities. During these months, Rasputin became friends with Princess Melissa and Anastasia of Montenegro. They'd married into the Romanov family and were heavily into the occult. They bonded with Rasputin over being outcasts. The royal family never really embraced them as their own. Soon enough, Rasputin was Anastasia's spiritual advisor. Rasputin had entered the royal palace. The Romanovs weren't doing as great as their predecessors. Russia's emperor at the time was Nikolai II. He had a poor track record as a leader and was unpopular with the people of Russia throughout his reign. His inability to make decisions even earned him a popular joke. He had lost a battle with Japan after trying to expand the empire. In 1905, the people had held a protest in St. Petersburg demanding reform. The police fired shots at the peaceful protesters, leading to hundreds of deaths and injuries. Apart from being unpopular and costly to the empire, Nikolai also had problems within his family. He and his wife, Alexandra, had four daughters and a son. Their son, Alexei, suffered from a rare disease, hemophilia, that is often the consequence of inbreeding. This prevented his blood from clotting normally and meant that he often had to stay in bed. Though royal families were rarely close to their children, Nikolai and Alexandra were very close to theirs. Alexei's disease could have been the foundation for this close bond, but Alexandria was the granddaughter of Britain's Queen Victoria, and her foreign heritage made her unpopular with the people who saw her as an outsider. This made her paranoid and demanding. Her son's disease was incurable, and her desperation made her look toward the controversial Rasputin. She adored anyone that she felt, you know, was, um, was some kind of holy man or healer. Um, she just went absolutely overboard and this is what happened in the case of Rasputin. One day, Alexei fell and scraped his knee. This was a tragedy as his blood would not stop pouring. Immediately, Rasputin arrived at the palace demanding to see the boy and claiming he had a divine vision that said Alexei's fate was in his hands. He'd learned this information from Anastasia, but to Alexandria, this was a sign that Rasputin was indeed a holy man. He asked if he could pray over their son. At the same time, he seemed to know what was wrong with him. The next morning, Alexei woke up in a perfect state the Romanov family was in awe, and Alexandria trusted Rasputin with her and her son's lives. Rasputin believed in himself because he knew exactly what to do, so to say, heal. As you can imagine, he wasn't holy or magical. Modern day scientists and historians believe that he had a few techniques. First of all, he prevented Alexei's doctor from giving him aspirin, which would thin his blood and make things worse. Second of all, he would comfort Alexei, pray with him, and make him feel strong and confident that he could overcome the disease. Pep talks and placebos were the biggest part of Rasputin's healing powers. Unfortunately, people at the time mistook these skills for something holy, as medicine and psychology were in the very early stages. The Romanov family was wearing rose-colored glasses when it came to Rasputin. He was giving the czar cocaine and opium to make him feel more confident and relaxed, and he would alleviate Alexandria's anxiety attacks. They both depended on him. When the maid accused Rasputin of violating one of their daughters, Alexandria was convinced that the maid was lying and fired her. Rasputin was extremely close to the children, and when the nanny expressed concerns about it, the children complained and had the nanny fired too. But rumors started spreading about Rasputin's personal life. At his apartment, he almost 24-7 had a horde of women who he would offer religious services. This implied parties with him at the center and lots of intercourse. He would also hire sex workers to go to the bathhouse with him, but they wouldn't bathe. And in fact, beating the women that he had brought into the bathhouse with him, roaring at her and going on about the demon of luxury. He was exercising these women, but he would also have intercourse with them. When Iliador found out, he and his fellow priests cornered Rasputin in the bathhouse and attempted to batter him with a crucifix. 
as he was damaging their reputation. Instead, Rasputin beat them and with the Romanov's help, had them exiled. But Iliodor was convinced Rasputin was the Antichrist and he wanted to kill him. Rasputin visited his home village in Siberia. Iliodor had hired a disfigured prostitute to wait for him there. Enraged by the stories of him beating prostitutes, she stabbed him in the stomach and even pulled out his intestines. But he survived. The very same day, World War I started and Nikolai left, determined to regain his people's trust. When he returned to the palace, Rasputin was basically Tsar Regent. He appointed incompetent ministers and drove their politics into the ground. World War I was handled very poorly by Nikolai. The lack of munitions and poor strategy led to death of millions. Back home, food shortages drove women into labor with negligible pay. People wanted a revolution. By now, Rasputin knew that he would die soon. His health was in decline and he couldn't heal anymore. He wrote to Alexandria that if he dies at the hands of her relations, all the Romanovs would die within two years too. Strangely enough, the Romanovs would soon meet a very dark end. The Bolsheviks arrested them and a group of drunk men robbed and butchered them under the pretense of a family photo in 1918. The Bolsheviks were so drunk that they couldn't even offer the family a clean death. They shot and stabbed them for 20 minutes and when they went to bury them in the woods, one of the girls was still breathing and gurgling. In 1916, Rasputin would meet his end too. Felix Yusupov, Nikolai's nephew by marriage, invited him to his mansion, apparently. He wanted Rasputin to cure his wife of her sex obsession. This was all a ruse. Yusupov was a bisexual, and he and his wife Irina would often attend swingers parties together. Yusupov led Rasputin into his basement dining room, which was arranged to look like a large party had just left the place. The table was filled with wine and cream cakes, and Rasputin was invited to indulge while Irina says goodbye to all her guests and joins him downstairs. Bored with waiting, Rasputin began drinking and eating, but it was all laced with cyanide, enough to kill anyone and then some, but Rasputin wouldn't die. Two hours and a half, he continued to be still alive after he eat endless cakes with poison. Scared Yusupov returned to the basement with his gun. He shot Rasputin who fell on the floor and returned upstairs. But still dreading the situation, Yusupov grabbed his doctor and went to check on Rasputin. He opened his eyes and lunged at Yusupov. His doctor fainted. Yusupov ran upstairs and brought some more friends with him, all holding guns. Rasputin was gone. He was crawling through the front garden. Yusupov looked at Rasputin one last time and shot him in the head. His friends shot him dozens of times, making sure that what they thought was the Antichrist could not come back to life again. They threw his body in a frozen river. When it was dug out, his hands were pointing up and his lungs were filled with water. This meant he'd still fought for his life, even in that state. Russian people were so afraid that he would come back to life that they burned his body to ashes. Hey, thanks for watching. Remember to give this video a thumbs up and subscribe for more. Until next time.